impressive, excited youngsters from all over the region are on hand for the return of Elvis Presley to Tupelo, Mississippi, the town where he was born. Elvis Presley's world was spinning at the speed of light when he returned home on September 21st, 1956 for a benefit concert. His shaking hips and curled lips were sending rock and roll shockwaves around the world, causing parents to panic, even in Tupelo. Like it was going to cause uh, some big trauma, you know, if you listen to this kind of music. <laughs> it wasn't made ever so famous. He wasn't afraid to explore the shaking and going on, which the white race didn't like. And he was brave enough to hang his career on it. Everything's tied together. The Brown decision, public school, desegregation, rock and roll music, Elvis Presley. I think it illustrates the fear that black and white in the South are going to come together. Because he's dissolving, in many ways, the racial distinctions. Without meaning to, and really without understanding it, he's upon a conflict because it's not just um, the mingling of blues and rock, it's also his reliance on a music that is, quote, in the minds of some, really sinful. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. In the paper and everything, the preachers, you know, um, it's devil music. Of course, that made it even more enticing to all of us, you know. In the 50s, we wouldn't have said the word sex aloud, but I think that's what Elvis was, you know, that I think that it was just a raw sexual urge that he projected that, that just and turned that just turned on uh, all you know, all the young girls. In just a few short years he'd been transformed from a shy truck driver to the number one singing sensation in America. His journey from a complete unknown to an entertainment icon began in Tupelo, Mississippi. The dramatic rise of Elvis Presley is forever linked to Tupelo, Mississippi. It's the importance of a place in biography. It's the foreground, it isn't the background. You can hear the soil in Elvis as you can hear the cement in Frank Sinatra. In the early 1930s, Tupelo changed from a sleepy farming community into a bustling center of commerce and manufacturing that attracted people like Vernon and Gladys Presley. The promise of prosperity was in the air when their son Elvis was born here on January 8, 1935, in the family's two-room shotgun shack. He was born in the early morning hours and they didn't know it at the time, but uh, Gladys Presley was carrying twins. And the first baby was stillborn. The fact that his twin died haunted him for the rest of his life. On the one hand, he felt triumphant. And on the other hand, I think he felt a sense of guilt that he had lived and the other had died and that he had to do enough living for the both of them. Tupelo, Mississippi offered Vernon and Gladys hope but the Depression kept it from becoming the land of golden opportunity. And my aunt and uh, Vernon, Elvis' father, would uh, get up every morning and, and they'd walk the levee from East Tupelo to Tupelo and uh, Vernon worked at a wholesale grocery wa warehouse over in town and then uh, mother of my aunt was a, uh, a seamstress. The kind of money they made for a 40-hour work week was uh, $2 and a half a week. It was a hard scrabble life for young Elvis and his family. But Gladys Presley refused to allow tough times to overwhelm them. Elvis's mother worked hard. She had various jobs. She worked in a laundry. She worked in a garment factory. She picked cotton. Gladys would pull him on the cotton sack down one row and up the other. 
as did many mothers in the cotton field. So he spent many of those early months being pulled on a cotton sack up and down rows in a cotton field. He heard the music that was being sung by the workers in the cotton fields and that it was a combination of blues, African, you know, kind of gospel sounds. He definitely was a sponge for all the musical influences around him. But all this music and the special destiny his mother had predicted for him was nearly cut short on April 5th, 1936, when the worst natural disaster in Tupelo's history struck. My daddy had me in the storm house, and he was watching out the door, and he said, oh, Lord, it's blowing Tupelo away. The Presleys were at church. Her father heard the storm warnings and commandeered a school bus so he could drive the family to safety. They hid at her uncle's home while waiting out the storm. When it was over, they saw fires lighting up all across town. The men piled into the school bus and drove back into town to lend a hand. Gladys and Elvis went to see if they still had a home. It survived. It went back on that side of uh, Presley's. It had done some damage to it, but it didn't, uh, didn't tear it up completely. It just done some minor damage. Gladys saw their salvation as a sign that confirmed her faith in the legend. She was the guiding light. Gladys Presley was probably the one that, uh, that brought Elvis up. And she made him go to church. Now, he, was, he went to church. The biggest thing we did back in those days was uh, we were in church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. The Presleys and their neighbors attended the nearby Assembly of God Church, which was unlike the more staid Baptist or Methodist churches. It was nothing for people to run down the aisles shouting, you know, that's the Assembly of God. And if they felt happy, they jumped, they shouted, they ran. People would talk in tongues, and they would lose control and do little jitterbug-like dances. It was just a ball of activity. Music was a big part of these, of these churches, and little Elvis was exposed to all of that. Brother Frank Smith, I have heard preach myself, and in the middle of a sermon, he would just say, I think we need a song reach over and pick up his guitar, sing a song, and then go right back into his sermon. You know, just as easy as having a conversation. After Sunday school was over, I'd gather the children down around the altar and sing a few courses. Then I'd pray with them, and we that between Sunday school and preaching time. And it wasn't always about Bible songs. And he had heard uh, Red Foley sing Old Shell, so he decided to teach it to all the kids. But Elvis was the only one that just embraced it and, and made it his song. So every time he had an opportunity to perform, forever, he did Old Shep. I remember the time at the old swimming hole When I was young and beyond But Shep was out there to the rescue Tupelo and the rest of the country still gripped by the Great Depression, times were hard for the Presley clan. But at least the church and his mother provided a measure of inspiration for the young Elvis. Though his father, Vernon, was struggling. He did work. He worked a series of, of kind of odd jobs for, for a number of years, but he also relied a great deal on his kind of a roguish charm, and he wound up getting into some trouble with the law. It was very difficult times, and he and uh, one of Gladys' uh, brothers and another friend had pooled their efforts together to raise a pig into a hog so that they could sell it. They sold the hog to uh, Orville Bean, and Orville paid them uh, what he felt was a fair price, but the boys didn't feel it was a fair price. They really felt slighted. And apparently they went out one night and had a lot of moonshine. 
and decided they'd get Orville Bean by adding a zero to the check and turning it into a $40 check. Orville Bean found out about it and they were prosecuted for fraud. Vernon and his accomplices were finally sentenced to three years in prison at the notorious Parchment Farm Penitentiary. America's Gulag, as it's been called. Gladys could not continue to make the payments for the house here on the Old South Tiller Road, and Orville Bean kicked them out. They stayed with relatives near the cotton mill while waiting for Vernon's release. Elvis, even though he was tiny, took on a kind of almost a paternal role, you know, that he had to take care of his mother. And he called her a little baby, even when he was tiny. And the neighbors said it was the cutest thing they ever saw. And he would say, does my little baby need anything? And he himself was only, you know, four years old. I think his mother really uh, inspires in him that, you know, you can, you know, be something. Gladys understood that you had to take matters into your own hands to get things done. When she heard that letters and a petition sent to the governor could get a prisoner parole, she went to work. Gladys took a petition around door to door with her little child in tow and pleaded for people to sign this petition so that her husband would get an early release. The pleas from Gladys and letters from prominent citizens, including the chief of police, a banker, the sheriff, and even Orville Bean got results. He was finally given an indefinite suspension of sentence in February of 1939. When the United States entered World War II, his friends told him about the crying need for workers in the booming defense plants in nearby Memphis, Tennessee. Vernon headed north. Gladys and Elvis stayed behind in Tupelo moving into a house next to the black section of town, Shake Rag. Vernon came home on the weekends, but there still wasn't enough money to make ends meet. They just scratched pennies to get by. And a lot of times they didn't have money. Sometimes somebody would give them some money, you know, to help them get on with life. You know that family was looked down on in that town not just lived across the tracks. They spent a time living in the black neighborhood, which in the 40s and 50s, that is grinding poverty. That's the epitome of what was called white trash. In 1941, Elvis was enrolled at Lawhorn Elementary School, where he made an important new friend, James Osborne. He said, I really like going around with you. He said, you're quiet, easy going and says you don't uh, raise king with nobody or fight with anybody. He said, I like that. And I said, well, I like you too because you, you do the same thing. James's older brother Carville had a radio show on WELO where he performed under the name Mississippi Slim. He reminded me of Hank Williams, sort of. He just, you know, I always wore a cowboy hat. And, um, he had his program and everyone, I guess he was the main entertainment in Tupelo at that time. He said, I would like to go up there and see him and meet him. And I said, okay, we'll go one Saturday. And I introduced him to my brother. Elvis said, I'd like to be on your program one of these days. And brother said, uh, I tell you what, said, uh, if you'll come up here on Saturday and let me play the guitar for you and you sing, when I think you're good enough, I'll let you on my program. I was with him the first time he sang at WLO, and uh, he was very nervous, but he, he did really well. And guess what he sang? Old Shep. Old Shep was his standard. My first memory of Elvis was when we both attended Lawhorn School when we, Elvis was in the fifth grade and I was in the third grade. Elvis was fortunate in fifth grade to have a teacher that was in tune with her students. She was so impressed that that particular year, 1945, they were gonna have the first ever talent contest at the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show. Ms. Grimes and uh, 
Mr. Tracy Franks, our principal, entered Elvis and I into the contest. The talent show run by Charlie Boren, the station manager at WELO, attracted kids from all over Tupelo. It was held on the main stage of the fairground. I can remember walking down Main Street with all the children in the parade. There were about 10 contestants, I believe and I think it was limited to children uh, 12 and under. Elvis sang Old Ship, uh, a cappella, and no, uh, no guitar, nothing. And uh, as I recall, he was pretty nervous at, at, at the tender age. I won third, and a girl singer named Nubbin Payne won second, and I have no idea who won fourth. The audience determined the winner by applause. I won first place in $25 war bond and a trophy and free rides to all the rides in the fair. And Elvis won fifth place in $5. Losing at the state fair didn't deter Elvis from trying to sing on WELO again. It was the big time, and WELO could be heard probably for a 100-mile radius. So, you know, he was reaching a pretty good little audience there. Charlie Boren told Elvis what he had to do to get back on the radio. And he said, well, Elvis, if you will please not sing Old Shep, I'll let you be on there. Like most boys his age, Elvis liked BB guns and rifles. That's what he wanted for his 11th birthday in 1945. But his mother worried about his choice. So he and Gladys hitchhiked into uh, Tupelo to Tupelo Hardware to look at guns. Elvis and his mother came in one morning. He was anxious to buy a rifle. I showed him the rifle first, and then I took it and showed him his guitar. He enjoyed that too. He told his mother he didn't have money enough to buy the guitar. It was 775, I believe. And she told him, she said, I'll finish paying the guitar out, but give up to buying a rifle. I think he was pulled between two things, his peers and what his heart desired. I think he was really tickled to get the guitar. The first person Elvis went to when he got the guitar was Brother Frank Smith, the same guy that had taught him to sing Old Shep. Frank taught him a few chords, and he said, son, if you can play these three chords, you can play anything. He couldn't wait to show his friends what he'd learned. He uh, wanted to know if uh, we wanted to come hear him play his guitar that his mother had bought him. So he brought his little guitar out and he, he sang old ship to us. He knew two or three chords. He wasn't all that good, but uh, his voice was always really good. He didn't shake his hips or uh, uh, move his arm or do any of those things back in those days. We were uh, too busy, I guess, uh, trying to rush him up so we could get to the creek bank and take a swim. <laughs> Elvis couldn't wait to take his guitar to his new school, Milam Junior High. He'd get up on the top of his desk and sit down, and he'd play the, the guitar and sing Old Shep or God Bless My Daddy. The teacher there had to close the windows when he sang because all the children in all the other classes would just stop and listen. But not everyone. I remember vividly one time uh, some of the more rougher type boys um, who were sort of jealous of Elvis' talent at that time, which was very uh, obvious, uh, scolded his guitar while we were in physical education and cut the strings. Kids are the cruelest people on earth, and they've always got to pick on someone. And who do they usually pick to pick on? The one person who marches to his own beat, and that was certainly Elvis. To escape, Elvis found sanctuary in a place where being different could be a virtue. The world he found in his favorite comic books. Elvis uh, said, I was the hero of every comic book I ever read. And, and that gets said and said and said, but it never gets said which comic books he liked. So I went uh, to a comic store. They gave me a pile and I sat there. As I was flipping through, I came across Captain Marvel Jr. It's Elvis. It is Elvis. It's the sideburns, the uh, glossy black hair, uh, the lightning bulb emblem used everywhere on the uh, uh, bracelets he gave people. 
but he took his personality too. His personality was humble and humorous. That is what he projects when he, you know, as the king, when he meets all his subjects. Unfortunately, there was no superhero interceding on the president's behalf. And the post-war recession made it hard for Vernon to find enough work to pay the rent. They had to move to a less expensive house on Green Street. There was a mixed neighborhood. Several white and black lived right there together. And uh, I lived with my grandparents, and they owned most of the property in that area. We had our own place to play. We had the watermelon patches and peanut patches and pear trees and fig trees and little swimming holes and fishing holes and pipe water coming out of the bank. So it wasn't any black and white thing during that time. Uh, we were just we were just boys. He would go with his friend Sam Bell to uh, tent revivals. They used to have what they called the Sanctified Church, and they would they would put a tent out there every year. They put a big tent out. And man, he couldn't stay out of there. We had to go with him down there. He'd go in there. He'd be singing. He'd be singing in that tent. They welcomed him in. And as soon as the welcome was extended, I mean, he got right in the middle of everything. Elvis discovered another kind of music across the tracks in Shake Rag. He had heard sanctified gospel from the black churches. He had heard country music from WLO Radio and the Grand Ole Opry but it was Shake Rag that introduced Elvis to the blues. The only way I remember Elvis Presley was a kid, you know. Back across the track at that time, we had a little string band over there. But on Saturday, they'd give these house parties, you know, fish fries and house parties. Man. And then he'd slip over there sometime, late, when they'd give those dances and peep and watch some women and men both shaking and going. So that's where he got his shaking from. His mother was the same way. People said about her in her youth, she did a mean Charleston. And they said about Elvis, he got it natural. Elvis had rhythm. Things still weren't working out for his father Vernon in Tupelo. In November 1948, the family sold their furniture and loaded their 1939 Plymouth with everything they owned and left Tupelo in the middle of the night. Destination, the big city, Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis and his family arrived in Memphis. Well, just a short drive from Tupelo, a bustling city that offered a chance for them to finally escape a life of dead-end poverty. And he and his mom and dad wound up living in a boarding house. The three of them shared one room, and all the residents had to use the sink in the bathroom for water to cook on uh, with hot plates and such. He was talking about right after World War II when people had a tough time finding good housing particular people that were in certain income brackets. So it was a tough way to live, but Gladys got work right away. It took Vernon a little longer. And they eventually, through um, public assistance, they were able to live at a place called Lauderdale Courts. The housing projects that emerged in the post-World War II period were seen, particularly for whites, they were seen as temporary spaces. In fact, Lauderdale Courts was not to be ashamed. Back in that day, it was like living in a real nice apartment. He's a pre-teenager, and he's going to start going to high school, which terrifies his mother, by the way, because Memphis is a huge city compared to Tupelo. The population of his high school, the Eumes High School in Memphis, is just as big as Tupelo. So that was, that was kind of uh, strange for Elvis and, and kind of a little bit shocking. Well, now that's all right, no mama. Elvis and other young people discovered something else that was shocking. A late night show on WHBQ called Red Hot and Blue, hosted by Dewey Phillips. 
Right now, it's old Phillips Bay Red Hot Blue coming through WHBQ and Hotel Tisca on the magazine floor. That Maybelline floor. Oh, that's right. They changed the name. Maybelline floor right in good old Memphis, Tennessee. He was a wild man on the radio. He had no compunction about saying anything or doing anything. He, he, he was strictly within bounds, something unlike anybody we'd ever heard in radio. He was truly uh, something different. Phillips was hired to play music intended to appeal to an African-American audience. Blues, spirituals, rhythm and blues. Music that was taboo to play during the day for the station's mostly white audience. He was a star, and everybody listened to him. You know, they'd check in anyway, riding around at night. You know, let's see what Dewey's doing. He's always doing something wacky. We kind of had to, um, you know, listen to that when we were in the car on the way to somewhere. We did not listen to that at home. But uh, it was uh, all the young people to listen to it. And I don't think we thought about the fact that they were black when they were singing. It was just music that we liked to hear. Dewey introduced a whole new audience to uh, to this music, what Alan Freed would later term rock and roll. Elvis was drawn to the sights and sounds of African American music and culture he found in Memphis. Walking the streets, he heard the blues and rhythm and blues. He also discovered where the musicians bought their flamboyant clothes. Lansky Brothers was the one that was featuring those style of clothing in Memphis, and Elvis would go down there, and he felt it was cool to look different. One Friday, he came in there. He had a uh, $10 bill, he bought two shirts, two $5 shirts. Man, he was clean. He come back and said, how, look, how I look? I said, man, you clean his Ajax. You really sharp. He looked kind of roguish, and uh, I didn't ever know what that word meant, really, but it was kind of a rough, kind of a bad boy look, maybe, I guess. And, and I think that's probably the look that he wanted to get across but he was not, he was not that at all. He had to defend his look from some guys who tried to cut his hair in the bathroom and from some teachers who picked on him. And uh, all of the teachers did, and our woodshop teacher, he would, he would make a little comment sometime about him, about his hair or something. But one teacher heard he could sing and asked him to perform at an upcoming talent show. It's at night time and it's a big thing. They had all kind of uh, people. Some would sing, some was playing, some was tumbling. They're doing all kind of different shows. They always come out and sing his song. Of course, everybody went crazy over it. When he won the high school talent show, you, you know, I just wondered. I was on the front row and I said, you know, maybe he's got a chance. He graduated from high school in 1953 and found a job at Precision Tool Company. Music was his dream, and against all odds and the expectations of nearly everyone, he set out to break into the music business. He needed to get attention and help from someone who could give him a break. Elvis read about the Memphis Recording Services and Sun Records in the newspaper. He thought its owner, Sam Phillips, was the key to realizing his ambitions. After the war, Phillips was working as an announcer and engineer for a Memphis radio station when he discovered an unmet need. Sam Phillips realized that there was a market out there for African-American blues music that people wanted to hear. And he always said, if I can find a white singer who can sing like a Negro, I'll make a million dollars. All of a sudden, one day, I just got a sudden, uh, 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 urge to go in this, in this recording studio, which was Mr. Sam Phillips' uh -huh. Memphis Recording Service. And so he paid, it was a few bucks, to go into a booth and sing a couple of songs, which he was going to give to his mother. Sam's assistant, Mary Ann Keisker, said that when she was recording him, she heard something that just struck her. Sam Phillips came in and Mary Ann Keisker for a year tried to convince him that this is the guy that you're looking for. In January 1954, while preparing for his career break, he met the 16-year-old Dixie Locke at church. They hit it off. They'd often go to hear gospel singers at the Assembly of God Church, the All Black East Trick Baptist Church, and marathon all-night gospel singings at Ellis Auditorium. 
Now that was, of course, one of our big favorite things to do. We never missed one. We would go down and just um, one quartet after the other, just sing all night long. So it was kind of in our blood from the time we were kids. In June of 1954, Elvis Presley finally got the call he'd been waiting for. Sam Phillips of Sun Records wanted him to record a song. For the session, Sam put Elvis together with bassist Bill Black and guitar player Scotty Moore. Nothing was working, and Mr. Phillips called for a break, and they started messing around. They were doing That's All Right, Mama. And he came back in and said, what was that? And they go, we don't know. We were just goofing around. He said, we'll do it again. By July 5th, they had their first record, That's All Right, Mama, with a radical new sound for the air. A white man singing a song originally recorded by a black man, Arthur Crowe. I think it was Bill Black later said, if we keep, keep this up, you know, we're going to get run out of town. Like it was going to cause uh, some big trauma, you know, if you listen to this kind of music. <laughs> Sam took the record over to Dewey Phillips. I happened to be in the studio the night that uh, Sam Phillips walked in with uh, a record called That's All Right Mama by a truck driving singer by the name of Elvis Presley. And all of a sudden, we heard this commotion and the phones lit up like a Christmas tree. And I didn't know what happened. I heard this sound of this recording and it was so different from anything that I'd ever heard. Dewey asked me if I would uh, see if I could uh, get a hold of uh, his parents and find out where Elvis was so that they could bring him down to the station. And I got Elvis's home phone number. Yeah. And I called in his mother's phone. I said, uh, Mrs. Presley, I said, is Elvis at home? She said, no, he's down here watching the Western with the Sousa. <laughs> <laughs> he was so nervous, he went to see a double feature with the Sousa was on Decatur. And so uh, they got in their truck. They went down actually themselves, Vernon and, and Gladys, and uh, walked up and down the aisle, found Elvis sitting there by himself and said, you know, all hell's breaking loose. So Elvis almost ran down to the radio station because uh, the Suzor was on North Main and the Chiska was on South Main. And uh, Dewey, unbeknownst to Elvis, had his microphone on and so he started talking to him immediately. One of the first things he asked him um, was, what school do you go to? And that was kind of a pivotal moment in the interview because by saying he was, had gone to Hume's High, Elvis was letting everybody know he was a white guy. Because a lot of the people who had been calling in apparently thought that Elvis was black because he was singing the rhythm and blues, you know, number, and um, so they weren't sure. But little did we know that, uh, that music was changing that very night from what we had known it growing up as kids. Now, I'll tell you one thing, before the day was over, everybody in town was talking about Elvis Presley. It was that quick in Memphis. It was instant. It's like a rocket, you know? It's, it's already left the launch, you know? It's not coming back. By October, it had sold over 6,000 copies to blacks and whites. I think he did understand the universality of music, and I think it touched him. He understood that music as his, in the same way that, quote, they, black musicians thought of it as, as theirs. Sam Phillips started booking the band into local venues like the Overton Park Shell in Memphis. He shared the bill with country star Slim Whitman. All of a sudden he looked down and the crowd was yelling and he looked down and he was shaking his leg and shook a little more <laughs> and they started screaming a little more. Oh, he did that from the first day. That's just the way he felt, you know. Well, I tell you, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not doing it on purpose. I mean, I'm aware of everything I do at all times, but it's just the way I feel. I mean, if, if I were, I, I can just picture somebody singing, uh, a rock and roll song standing real still. I mean, I, actually, I'd go nuts standing there, you know? Mm -hmm. In October of 1954, Sam Phillips scored a major victory for its fledgling stars. He secured an audition spot for Elvis and the band at Nashville's Ryman Auditorium, the home of the Grand Ole Opry. It was the cathedral of country music. And Elvis, he might have been a, a little tiny bit country but he was a lot of other things. Elvis chose to play the anthem of country music made famous by Bill Monroe. And he had a song called Blue Moon of Kentucky, and it was a waltz, it was a mournful waltz. Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. 
but it was his song and it belonged as much to the people here as it belonged to him. And this young kid, 19 years old, from Memphis walks out on this stage and he sings Blue Moon of Kentucky in a 4-4 cut time. Oh, well, I say Blue Moon of Kentucky just to keep on shining. Shine on the one that's gone and left me blue. And the crowd is underwhelmed uh, by the performance because of what he has done to one of their standards. Elvis said, Jim Denny, who was in charge of the opera, told me to go back to Memphis driving my truck. They really thought he was rock and roll, and they didn't want that at the Grand Ole Opry. In spite of the setback Elvis suffered at the Grand Ole Opry, Sam Phillips was undeterred. Pressing on, he secured a booking on the Shreveport-based Louisiana Hayride starting in November of 1954. The Hayride was similar to the Opry, but more nurturing. The Opry was for made talent. You had to be somebody to get on the show. It was a showcase of stars, and the Louisiana Hayride earned its name as the cradle of the stars because they would give unknowns an opportunity to perform on this stage. You got to remember when the Hayride and the Grand Ole Opry was in existence, you didn't have TV. And people didn't have anything to really do but listen to the radio or go out at night and get a hamburger or go ride and go to a drive-in. The simple things of life. The shows broadcast on Shreveport's KWKH radio heard throughout Louisiana, East Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee every Saturday night. At first, the producers weren't sure what to think of Elvis. He was dressed a little differently from everybody else, of course, and uh, the others had on their Western clothes and their, their dude outfits, and uh, he was uh, had on white bucks, I believe, uh, pink coat, Horace Logan was the producer of the show, and the head MC, and Horace usually, introduced the important people. He wasn't too sure about Elvis. So at the very last minute, he says, Frank, you do it. He's only 19 years old. He has a new, distinctive style. Elvis Presley, let's give him a nice hand. Elvis, how are you this evening? But he was very nervous, and he asked what he ought to do. And I said, just do what you've been doing prior to now. I said, do, do what you do naturally. Well, I'd like to say how happy we are to be down here. It's a real honor for us to be, get a chance to appear on the Louisiana Hayride. We're going to do a song for you. You got anything else to say, sir? No, I'm ready. <laughs> We're going to do a song for you. We've got on Sun Record. It goes something like this. Well, that's all right, Mama. That's all right with you. He came that's out and right did his thing. And uh, it, was, uh, it was different. And uh, they never seen anybody run across the stage and jump and hoop and holler, you know, like he did. So they was all shocked. What is this boy doing to our country music, you know? The audience didn't grab on to Elvis uh, immediately because it was an adult audience primarily. So it took a few weeks for the word to get out that Elvis was here and he was making moves on stage that were, uh, you know, really something else. And so the next thing you know, we had kids coming. The old people, could, they just quit coming. Those kids wanted to see Elvis, and they made so much noise, they couldn't hear their favorite act, you know? So that's, uh, that's how it got really started big. He was asked to become a member of the Louisiana Hayride Show, which was a big, big deal for him. The band asked drummer DJ Montana to join them. Next thing you know, we was working all the time, every weekend somewhere. And man, we was working ballparks, uh, high school gyms, uh, on the back of trucks. We were working anything he could. Well, he had to work, he didn't, there was no money, you know, just, they didn't give him, it was about $100, $150 a night for all of us. So we had to work seven nights a week, you know, to, to make a living. It's while he's performing at Louisiana Hayride that he starts to go out on the road. We didn't worry about the money, just going out and having a good time. They were building an audience, one gig, one radio station at a time. We'd see a big antenna up there, out in the middle of nowhere, and we'd go out there and stop and bring their Elvis's record. And use it as a, it was a disc jockey in this little booth, in this little house. And we'd go in and they was glad to see us, because we was the only one out there. 
So when, they, when we come in and say, will you play this? Yeah. Sometimes they'd play one, you know, they'd go get his guitar and they'd play. And, and just, that's what, I guess that's how we got our records played. At first, no one knew what to call their new sound. They didn't quite know what it was. And, well, we didn't either. You know, we didn't know what to call it. Well, we didn't know what to call it anything. The beginning of rock and roll, you know, and, and it pulled in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the blues and a lot of the black music that was coming in. And of course, uh, being from the Deep South, um, I don't know how much this you want me to say, but you know, you couldn't, uh, you weren't supposed to listen to it. And it was just great. Without meaning to, and really without understanding it, he's upon a conflict because it's not just um, the mingling of blues and rock, it's also his reliance on a music that is quote, in the minds of some, really sinful. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. In the paper and everything, the preachers, you know, um, it's devil music. Of course, that made it even more <laughs> enticing to all of us, you know. In the 50s, we wouldn't say the word sex aloud. But I think that's what Alphys was, you know, that I think that it was just a raw sexual urge that he projected that just turned on uh, all, you know, all the young girls. It's around this time that someone in Memphis gives Colonel Tom Parker a call and says, you know, there's, there's a boy out here you might want to come and take a look at. The Colonel would change Elvis's life forever. And what the Colonel understands is that Elvis can go beyond Sun Records. In November 1955, Parker brokered a deal with RCA that bought Sun's rights to Elvis for $40,000, a record amount at the time. Well, one time, we was, uh, me and Sam were in the control room. He just happened to say that, well, if, if you're going to make a mistake, make a $12, $12 million mistake. Well, you should have said a billion dollar mistake. Chet Atkins, who was assigned to produce the first RCA recording session, wasn't betting on its success. He hired only one of the backup singers Elvis requested. He said, oh, don't make a difference. Just come on come on in and do some booze and ahs. He's just, a, Elvis is just a passing fad. He ain't going to be around long. Don't make any difference. Just do some booze and ahs. The first recording session went good because Elvis knew pretty much what he was doing. And of course, Heartbreak Hotel swept the country overnight. It's a million. The first one, Heartbreak which is unheard of. Nobody ever got a million sell out right out of the chute. And after that, it was one million after another. The Colonel kept things moving. Parker negotiated a buyout of the Hayride contract and set his sights on TV. We had never done that before. A bunch of hillbillies out of Tennessee and Louisiana. What do we know about television, you know? The first TV break came when Elvis auditioned for the stage show a variety series hosted by the Dorsey Brothers that was produced by Jackie Gleason. He said, I knew I had to look different from Mr. Gleason. He said, I just couldn't walk in dressed like anybody else. He said, so I got me a real shark truce green suit and a green shirt and a green tie. And he said, I walked in with that, you know, long hair and, and my, my movements and all. And I said, what happened, Elvis? He said, Jackie Gleason looked up and he said, son, I don't know what the hell you do, but you look so different. You gotta, you gotta be a star. The one and only Elvis Presley. Elvis's career was really taken off. Starting in January of 1956, he made the first of six guest appearances on the Dorsey Brothers musical variety show, followed by two weeks on Milton Berle's program. The audience grew every time he was on TV. TV appearances were squeezed in between a non-stop schedule of live performances held in ever larger venues. In April, he started a month-long engagement at the New Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas, a town that would become synonymous with Elvis Presley. By May of 1956, the constant work gave him enough money to buy a modern ranch-style house in an upper-middle-class Memphis neighborhood for himself and his parents. It had only been three years since the family lived in public housing in Lauderdale Courts. 
He really took care of his mother. Well, that's why he bought the house, for her. He didn't need a house, you know, not really. We was always on the road, so why would he need a house? His notoriety and star power were on the right. His sexy rendition of Hound Dog sent Milton Burroughs' ratings through the roof. Other broadcasters who shunned Elvis were now in hot pursuit. Steve Allen, who was in a ratings war with Ed Sullivan, offered him $5,500 to appear on his primetime NBC show on July 1st. They just did not know what to do with him. They, they, they made a cowboy out of him, had a cowboy hat on him with Imogene Coker. You remember the Andy Griffith and him? Ooh, Lord, that, that he didn't like that at all. Next, they asked Elvis to sing to a basset hound. I think Steve Allen was one of those people who considered himself to be the tastemakers in this country. And obviously this was tasteless. And so he was making fun of it. Well, if you wanted to get along with Elvis, you didn't mention the Steve Allen show. <laughs> Controversy continued to swirl around Elvis, while tastemakers like Steve Allen dismissed him as a passing fan. Stark segregationists saw him as a genuine threat. Here's a guy, hillbilly cat. We can't tell. Is he black? Is he white? What is he? And so I think that's a threat because he's dissolving, in many ways, the racial distinctions. And that threatens these people. Everything's tied together. The Brown decision, public school, desegregation, rock and roll music, Elvis Presley. I think it illustrates the fear that black and white in the South are going to come together. They are going to uh, lead a charge, a highly publicized charge, uh, against rock and roll. They are going to call for the banning of rock and roll records. Uh, they are going to call for jukebox operators to uh, take those records off their jukebox. We've uh, set up a 20-man committee to Go away with these, this vulgar, animalistic <laughs> rock and roll box. In Jacksonville, a civic group filed a petition with local judge Marion Gooding, hoping he'd censor Elvis's upcoming performances. The judge called the sinful young singer into his chambers and told him that he would accept wiggling from side to side, but no back and forth motions. So instead of doing his little, when they did a roll on the drums, how Elvis would cut up with that roll on the drums, instead of him doing anything like this, he would go like this. Da -da 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 and the crowd would scream. He was perfectly still. And he wiggled his little finger to the drums. And they would go wild. Those three shows won Elvis a lot of new fans, including one no-nonsense judge sitting quietly in the back row. As he completed his Florida tour, Hollywood came calling. The Colonel had secured him a movie deal. On Friday, August 17th, he reported for work on the Civil War drama, Love Me Tender. This was his first shot at the silver screen, something Elvis had always dreamed about. But some would argue that the most important career break for the controversial singer was about to come and appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan saw him on the Steve Allen Show and he signed him for three shows, which was a, the greatest thing that ever happened to Elvis. When you do the Ed Sullivan Show back then, that was as far as you could go. That was the height. It was a rating smash and they'd get an endorsement from Ed Sullivan after the third show. Ed Sullivan, you know, walked over and said, this is an all right guy, regardless of what you think about him. And at that time, Elvis really needed that to boost his career. It's like a coronation for Elvis Presley. Suddenly, to many people, he's not quite as scary as they thought. Imagine one kid from Tupelo gets on television and because of a performance, shakes the soul of a society. 1956 was Elvis Presley's rocket ride to superstardom. But it all happened so fast, and so I didn't even have time to think about it. It, uh, everything just, just, just like, like that, that, you know? And, uh, and it just kept going, and it's still doing that way, and I, I, I can't even think about it. And in fact, uh, I don't even like to wake up in the morning. I'm afraid I might wake up. But it might be all over. I'm afraid I might be back driving a truck. In September 1956, 
Elvis Presley was returning to his hometown in Tupelo, Mississippi. His manager, Colonel Parker, had arranged a special homecoming concert at the State Fair. Elvis said, more than anything else, I want the folks back home to think right of me. He was still the little kid coming home that sometimes was made fun of, that sometimes people didn't want to hear sing, that people remembered in clothes that didn't fit. And you know, all of this goes through one's mind when they're trying to go back. But the town turned out for Elvis. Banners were stretched across Main Street that said, Tupelo welcomes Elvis home. I think it is a triumph for him. He's coming back and there's a parade in his honor. I mean, that's a pretty amazing thing for a guy that his biggest performance previously was, was at the show at the fair when he was like nine years old, you know, singing Old Shep. Every band was asked to perform an Elvis song, but it was all Elvis. Everything was Elvis. Backstage, Elvis and his parents saw people they hadn't seen in years. My guess is people shook hands with Vernon Presley, who'd never shaken hands with him before, patted him on the back, uh, reached out to his mother. Vernon says, do you want to go in and see the boy? I said, yeah, we'd like to see Elvis, but I said, we can't get in. He said, just follow me. I get to go backstage and, and meet him and uh, present him with this hat and put it on his head, and with that, he just grabbed me and hugged me and kissed me. Oh, I could have just died at the moment. <laughs> they were literally hanging off the grandstand. The place was packed. There were more people in the grandstand than in the city of Tupelo, by far. None of us could recall the opening act. Uh, we, we just knew Elvis was coming out. And then he comes. And, uh, and I will always remember uh, his first line. He says, seeing all you folks out here today just brings a big lump up in my wallet. And there's just a, it takes a minute before it sinks in. And then, then there's this laughter and applause and then he goes into his act. We just sort of all just rushed to the front and so did a lot of other people. But luckily we got up front right at the stage. You almost knew it was music history and I don't know how to explain that. It was such a good time of our lives too, to be teenagers and be young and be free. I feel for sure his parents were just exuberant because they got the red carpet treatment and when they were here, they were so poor. I think there was something about him that day that opened Tupelo's eyes, substantially changed that town's attitude about Elvis. The two biggest events in Tupelo would be Elvis's return and uh, the Tupelo tornadoes. Both shook things up. You know, it's really been mind-boggling to me what he has become because I think he is so much more than just a country singer now and just a rock and roll uh, singer. He's, he's an inspiration to a lot of people. He showed the possibilities that it doesn't matter where you were born, it doesn't matter what circumstances you were in. You can still change yourself and in that sense, change the world.